Amen. Amen. Well, while I'm getting ready here this morning, um, just uh, a couple kind of quick uh, additional announcements. I'm, I'm so grateful for the word that Sarah's going to be sharing um, this coming Saturday. Uh, we've been discussing it at home, and she's been sharing with me kind of the revelation that she's been getting on the topic. And uh, ladies, I'm telling you, you're in for something good. So do not miss it. Uh, we're also looking forward, as Ian said, to Wednesday nights, a week from this Wednesday night. Uh, we're going to start a series called Things Above, Things Above, and it's taken from Colossians chapter 3, where the Apostle Paul writes and says, uh, set your mind on things above where Christ is at the right hand of God, and ultimately this is going to be a teaching on not just the hope of heaven, but the reality of heaven. It is going to be um, life-giving, hope-giving, it's going to be healing for some of you, and um, I, I don't want anybody to miss it, so make sure you're here starting Wednesday night, March 20th, it's going to be fantastic. And then last but not least, for those of you who have called or commented or texted or whatever um, about my whereabouts last Thursday night, uh, being at the State of the Union address in Washington, D.C. as a guest of one of the congressmen, uh, was, was an interesting thing, I must say. Uh, I'll just tell you all that what you see on TV is not exactly what's happening in the room at, the, at all times, and so uh, it, was, uh, it was interesting. I'll just leave it at that, but thank you for praying. It was fantastic to sit there and pray. Uh, you have to be in your seat at least one hour before it starts, so it was supposed to start at 9 o'clock sharp. Uh, for whatever reason, we don't know. The president was about 15 or 20 minutes late, and um, so we were, we were in our seats a good hour and a half, um, but it was great just to be able to sit there and pray, to watch, to observe, and uh, quite, a, quite an event. But anyway, with all that being said, let's move on into the Word of God this morning. When I say the word miracle, I'm going I'm to ask you, let me get some feedback from you all. When I say the word miracle, what comes to your mind? Somebody help me over here. We'll start with y'all. Miracle. Healing? Huh? Unbelievable. Unbelievable? Yeah, good. How about this section? Jesus, Jesus good. Call to action? Good, okay, over here. Miracle. Wholeness? Something that you never thought would happen. Yeah, good. How about the balcony, or not the balcony, the whatever, what, what do we call that back there? The back row, the back 40, how about y'all? <laughs> Supernatural, thank you. Impossible, Impossible yep. Not always, how you expect. not always how you expect, good, good, good. So yes and amen to all of that. Everybody gets an A, go ahead, give yourself a great right round of applause. So to some degree, everything that we said, I think, is going to fit into this definition that I want to give you for a working definition this morning. So here's what a miracle is. A miracle is a supernatural intervention from God that changes the natural order and progress of things. So I want you to think about what a miracle is. It's God supernaturally intervening in a situation and because of his intervention, it causes what would naturally flow to be interrupted and then something supernatural, unexpected, impossible, miraculous happens. Okay, so when we're talking about a miracle, that's what we're talking about. Now here's another thing about miracles. I'm going to give you a little foundation this morning before we dive into this. All of us at some point in our life are going to need a miracle. And you're either going to need a miracle for yourself or you're going to need an, a miracle for a family member, a friend, a loved one. We are going to be confronted as followers of Jesus with the need for a miracle to happen. So let me give you some really good advice. The time to figure out how best to get a miracle is not in the midst of needing the miracle. The time to figure out how to get a miracle from God is before the miracle is needed. Because when the miracle is needed, if that's when you're scrambling to try to figure it out, you're probably going to get taken out rather than receive a miracle. That's how that works. 
And so I want to try to help give you this morning some principles that'll, that'll help you learn before you need the miracle so that you have your best chance of receiving one. I also need to preface this by saying, y'all, we, we can't put God in a box. Like I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you four things this morning that I want you to remember about miracles. And I can't tell you, if you do these four things, yes, they, God will, you know, I'm not doing that. But what I am telling you about these four things is that God seems to respond to these attitudes and actions in our life and he seems to respond with miracle power, okay? I understand that God is sovereign and that ultimately he does what he wants, when he wants, with who he wants, however he wants. That's what sovereignty means. But I also know there's things that we can do on our end based in the scripture and the examples in the scripture that God seems to respond to. And so that's what I wanna share with you this morning. I wanna have uh, principles available to us that hopefully will cause uh, all of our chances to increase to get a miracle when we need it, okay? Let me give you some scriptures just to, to talk about miracles and give you some foundation again, some promises, some things to think about. Luke chapter one, verse 37, there's this young girl by the name of Mary. She's a teenager and she has an encounter with the angel Gabriel. Gabriel shows up and says, you're gonna have a baby. And Mary, thinking natural thoughts, says, how am I gonna have a baby? I've never known a man. Because she's thinking on the natural level. And then in Luke 137, Gabriel responds to her and says, for with God, nothing will be impossible. Hey, Mary, I'm not talking about the natural level here. I'm talking about God intervening and, and disrupting and, uh, the, the natural order of things and, and God doing something that was impossible and you didn't expect it and it wasn't the way that you thought. We're talking about God coming and intervening. Now, here's what else I'm convinced about. 30 years later, at the story we're going to read in just a minute in John chapter 2, Mary remembered this. In fact, I'm convinced that she just didn't remember it 30 years later. I think she marinated in that word for 30 years up to the point where it finally was going to come to pass to her in a very public and profound way. For with God, nothing will be impossible. Matthew 19, 26 Jesus said these words, with men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. All things mean all things. It means that there is nothing that God can't do. Things that seem impossible to you and I, those are things that God can do. On another level, in the church corporately, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 10, verse 28, verse 29, again, multiple times, I want you to see the seriousness of this, The scripture talks about the gift of miracles that the Holy Spirit gives to the church, okay? So things that are impossible with men are possible with God. There's nothing impossible for God. God gives miracles to the church. And then finally, Galatians chapter three, verse five, it talks about that God works miracles in our midst in response to our faith our belief in him, our belief that he is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we ask or think, Ephesians 3.20, our belief that God can disrupt the natural order with a supernatural intervention to cause something to happen that we weren't expecting and it's glorious in its nature, okay? So miracles, we're talking about our God being a miracle working God. Settle it, same yesterday, today, and forever. We've already heard that, Hebrews 13.8. Now, let's read our story. We're continuing our study in the book of John, John chapter two, verses one through 11. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Now, both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding, and when they ran out of wine, the mother of Jesus said to Jesus, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. Now there were set there six water pots of stone according to the manner of purification of the Jews containing 20 or 30 gallons apiece. Jesus said to them, the servants, fill the water pots with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And Jesus said to them, draw some out now and take it to the master of the feast. And they took it when the master of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine 
and did not know where it came from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew. The master of the feast called the bridegroom, and he said to him, Every man at the beginning sets out the good wine, and when the guests have well drunk, then the inferior. You have kept the good wine until now. This beginning of signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. What a story. One of my favorites in all of the scripture. We're going to have some fun with this as God speaks to us this morning. All right. Principles for miracles. Principle number one is this, and this might seem obvious, but we have to say not just the obvious, but how it can affect our pursuit of miracles. If there is going to be a miracle, number one, there has to be a need. Okay, you're looking at me like deer in the headlights. Are you with me this morning? Yeah, there has to be a need. Well, of course, Steve, there has to be a need. Well, I don't want to just talk about the fact that there's a need. What was the need in the story? They ran out of wine. This is a horrible cultural event. Weddings back then lasted seven days. You can't run out of wine on day three or four. It's going to be shame and embarrassment and everything else. People are going to talk for years. Oh, yeah, there's that young couple. Remember what was big about their wedding? They ran out of wine. Okay, so we don't, this is the need. We can't have that. But, beloved, listen to me. It's not just the need, it's what the need does to us as we're pursuing the miracle. And here's what needs do. Needs overwhelm us. Needs steal our faith. Needs discourage us. Needs cause us to look at the need rather than looking at the need meter. And so what I wanna tell you this morning is whatever your need might be, You're going to have to look beyond your need if you're going to pursue a miracle. You're going to have to look beyond that. And you're going to have to look to the one who has the ability to meet your need. I know it sounds so very simple, but things that are the easiest to understand intellectually many times are the hardest things to process spiritually. And so, so many times we'll find ourselves going, okay, yeah, miracles are great, and here's the four points that Pastor Steve is going to give us or gave us, and, and then all of a sudden the need arises, right? And we find ourselves wavering. Oh my gosh, does God love me, and what's he doing? And if he loved me, that he wouldn't allow this to happen, and whoosh, we just start spinning out. Am I the only one in the room that's ever done that before? I think not. I think not. See, we like the sound of miracles. We love the sound of, I'm going to deliver you from Egypt, but we don't like the sound of, okay, but we're not going to give you hay to make bricks anymore, and you still have to maintain the same amount of quota of bricks. We we love the sound of coming out of Egypt and heading into the promised land, but we don't like staring at the Red Sea in front of us and going, now what's going to happen? See, the, the need sometimes overwhelms us. And then we love the sound of heading into the promised land. But, but we don't like the conflict that's there. See, th- th- there's, these, there's these needs and these things that happen that challenge us, that cause us what? To murmur and complain and to doubt and get our focus, get our, our sight is wrong. And so what we're understanding about this is, okay, you've got a need. Not making light of your need at all. There's people in this room right now. There's people watching online. You have serious need. Not making light of it. But I'm saying don't let the need blind you from God and his miracle working power. Don't let that happen. All right, number two. As you're pursuing miracles, there has to be a heartfelt ask. Okay, now I know in this story, it sounds like Mary's just making a simple statement of fact. Jesus, they have no wine. But it's not written that way. It, it, it's, it's written as an ask. This is Mary, the Jewish mother of her Jewish boy. And if I could say it, she's, she's saying it like this. Jesus, they don't have any wine. They've run out of wine. Time to do something about it. This is an ask. Friends, if we're going to see miracles in our lives, there has to be a heartfelt ask. 
John chapter 7, verses 7 and 8. This is so rich, so pregnant with spiritual truth. Jesus said, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, it'll be open. Ask, seek, knock. A-S-K. Ask. I love it. It's the, it's the what do you call it? It's an, huh? Acronym. Yeah, thank you. I was just testing you, Sarah Berger, to see if you knew what it was. <laughs> So Charles Spurgeon, the Prince of Preachers, refers to this passage of scripture and listen to what he says about it. He said, what is an ask? Asking is this, asking is stating your need with desperation attached to it. Desperation. In other words, this isn't just something where you kind of throw it out there and hope and see maybe God, if he's not too busy or likes you enough, will do. No, this is pressing in. This is making an ask. And there's desperation attached to it. I I start looking through the scriptures and there's so many examples, but I, I think of the young woman, Hannah, in the Old Testament, who's barren and wants to have a baby more than anything. And she finds herself at the altar and she's pouring her heart out before God. And you can't even really understand the words that she's saying. And then Eli, the clueless priest, walks in and sees this young woman pouring her heart out to God, asking in desperation. And the only logical conclusion he can come to about her is that she's drunk. Because he's so clueless. He's so clueless about what it is to ask with desperation. It's so foreign to him that he can only apply a natural answer to her spiritual cry. How tragic in the church that we've lost what it means to ask with desperation. And God forbid that we see the altar filled with people asking in desperation. And we would sit back in our religious piety and say, well, I think they were just being a little dramatic. Watch your words. You don't know where I've been. You don't know where they've been. What you look like as religious drama could be a heartfelt ask. And you mocking it might just expose your own shallowness as it relates to you asking yourself and you being familiar with that. Asking. What's seeking? Seeking, according to Spurgeon, is this. Seeking means to present your cause and your case to God. To present your argument to him as to why you believe God should do this. Did you know that you can do that with God? Jesus is talking about it right here. So in the scripture, do we see anyone presenting their case to God why God should do something? Of course we do. God says to Moses about the children of Israel after they create the calf and worship and and idolize the calf. What does God say to Moses? Moses, I'm done with these people. I'm gonna wipe them out. I'm gonna start a whole new nation with you and you're gonna be in charge. Now Moses had already had enough problems with these people. It would have sounded pretty good to Moses to start fresh with a whole new group of people. But what does Moses do? He says, Lord, you can't do that. He's telling God what he can and can't do. God, you can't do that. Because God, if you wipe all these people out, what are the surrounding nations gonna say? See, he's presenting this cause and his case and his argument to God. God, you can't do this because people are gonna say, you just brought him out here into the wilderness to kill him. God, don't do that and here's why. That's what seeking is. Then there's a whole nother level of prayer and that is knocking. And what Spurgeon says about knocking might make you a bit uncomfortable. It does me, except that I know it to be true personally and I know it to be true biblically. Knocking, Spurgeon says, is demanding. Do we see anybody in the scripture making a demand of God? You better believe it. And she's a widow, and we're gonna talk about her in just a few minutes. 
asking, seeking, knocking. If we're gonna see miracles, there has to be a heartfelt ask. It just has to be that way. Now, let's progress in this here. Why do you think Mary asked Jesus to do something about the lack of wine? What, what is it about this story? I know we read it from this side of, of history and, you know, okay, it was his first public miracle and that, but try to put yourself in the story for a minute. Why did Mary say, Jesus, they're out of wine. You need, you need to do something about this. Maybe, maybe. These are my opinions, I'm telling you clearly. Maybe she understood that Jesus would care enough about this young couple and their parents that he would actually move on their behalf. Maybe she thought, you know what? Jesus would care about them being embarrassed. This, this isn't too small of a thing to ask. And so maybe what would be known later is 1 Peter 5, 7, cast all your cares on him because he cares for you. Maybe she just thought, you know what? Jesus might actually do something about this. Nothing too big, too small, and so there you go. Let's, let's make the ask. Maybe that's it. Well, there's another reason. Maybe, maybe Mary thought it was time for Jesus to finally do a public miracle. She was told 30 years earlier that her child was gonna be the Messiah. And with being the Messiah comes all of the miracle working power of being the Messiah. So she's been waiting, Jeannie, she's been waiting for 30 years for this public miracle Messiah stuff. And so maybe she's sitting there going, you know what, now would be a good time. It's not too big of a miracle, you know. Maybe now would be a really good time. Maybe that's it, I don't know for sure. Or maybe, and this is my personal opinion, again, I'll, I'll tell you that, I'm not gonna die on this hill, I'm not gonna argue with anybody. I think, I think maybe Jesus had done a miracle already in private. Because the language she uses as we see this story unfold seems to indicate that he had already done stuff at home. Remember, at this point, Mary is a widow. Joseph's out of the picture. And she got multiple kids. A widow with multiple kids, living in poverty stricken out back of Nazareth. You think there weren't times where there was lack and, and substance running out in their home? I think it's very likely. I think it's very likely in private, there was a situation where Mary had, had to look at her boy and go, can you do anything about this? He kind of looked around and went. <laughs> and the miracle happened. I do know this, whether she had previous history or experience with Jesus doing a miracle, I can't say for sure, but I do know this. Yesterday's miracles fuel today's bold requests. Habakkuk chapter three, verse two. If you go to Habakkuk in the Old Testament in your Bible, it's where the pages are stuck together because you've never read the minor prophet Habakkuk. But Habakkuk three, two, he says, Lord, I've heard of your fame and I stand in awe of your deeds. Lord, renew them in our day and in our time. Make them known to us. God, we've heard about the miracles before. We know what you did in delivering the children of Israel. We know all the glorious wars that the children of Israel miraculously won over the last 1,500 years. But now, Lord, we're asking you to do it here, right now, right here in front of us. Because you've done it before, do it again. I think this was burning in Mary's heart. Lord, you've done it before, now do it again, right here in this situation. This is bold. A really bold ask. Number three, there can't just be a need. There can't just be an ask. There's gotta be, listen to me, beloved, faith-filled persistence. 
This next section of this story, I love it. It is so awesome to me because Mary doesn't take no for an answer. She says, Jesus, they're out of wine. And Jesus says to her, woman, he didn't even call her mom. (laughs) Parenthetically, you know why? Because he's letting her know, your natural authority over me as my birth mom doesn't have authority here in the kingdom. You're a woman right now. You're not my mama. Woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. Could summarize it and say this. Jesus said, it's not my business and it's not my time. Talk about a no. It's not my business. What does this have to do with me? Oh, and by the way, it's not my time. It's not time for me to come out and be public Messiah. It's like she doesn't even hear what he says. She doesn't even pay attention to what he says. And then she says to the servants, whatever he tells you to do, you better go ahead and do it. I know he just told me no, but if he tells you something else, you better obey. Because I've been in this situation before, and he did something miraculous in our midst. Faith-filled persistence. It's this. It's recognizing that the first apparent no might not be the final no. No. Sometimes the first no is God just pushing you or pulling something out of you to see what you actually know. What do you know about him? What do you know about his goodness? What do you know about his power? What do you know about what it is to trust him when you have a need? We're gonna see this again clearly in a minute. Faith-filled persistence. Luke chapter 18, verses one through eight. Again, the story of another widow. Then Jesus spoke a parable to them that men always ought to pray and not lose heart. And he said, there was in a certain city a judge who did not fear God nor regard man. Now, there was a widow in that city and she came to him saying, get justice for me for my adversary. And he would not for a while, but afterward he said within himself, Ugh, though I do not fear God nor regard man, yet because this widow troubles me, I will avenge her lest by her continual coming. In other words, her faith-filled persistence. She weary me. Do you see what this woman is like here? She's troubling the unrighteous judge. She is continually coming to him. And then I love this word here. It says that she is making him weary. I've never seen this in any other place in the scripture. Listen to this. Literally, what it means is this woman is giving the judge a black eye. She is wearying him. She is hitting over and over and over It's called knocking. Over and over and over. And she's coming over and over and over again. And I've said no, but she's troubling me. I'm exhausted. She doesn't stop coming. And I'm tired of her giving me a black eye. Gosh, I'm just going to give her what she's asking for. Then Jesus said, hear what the unjust judge said. And shall God not avenge his own elect who cry out day and night to him, though he bears long with them? In other words, he's being patient with them. I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? Faith filled persistence. It's taught in the scripture. We see it rewarded in the scripture 
over and over and over again. There's this phrase that Jesus uses, and it's, it's varying degrees, but this is, this is what it is. Let it be to you according to your faith. Or let it be to you according to your desire. And it is people who are persistent in approaching him so that he will do a miracle for them. They push through the crowds. They, get, they, they obliterate every single argument or objective because they need a miracle. And so in Matthew chapter 8, we see the story of a centurion who comes to Jesus And he says, Jesus, I need you to heal my servant because he lies paralyzed and he's tormented. Jesus said, all right, I'll go with you. And the guy goes, no, 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 you don't need to go with me. I too am a man under authority. And I know that when I just say something, things happen. And so Jesus, if you'll just speak the word, I know that my servant will be healed. And what did Jesus tell him? You're right. You go ahead and go home, he's healed. He's asking, he's seeking, he's knocking, he's telling him, Jesus, here's what you can do. I know you can do this. And Jesus said, let it be to you according to your faith. Matthew chapter nine, here's two blind guys. And what does it say? They're crying out. They're just not sitting on the side of the road. Man, wouldn't it be great if Jesus did something for us? No, 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 no. They're crying out. Lord Jesus, son of David, have mercy on us. And they finally come into the house where Jesus is. Jesus said, do you believe I can do this? They go, absolutely. And he says, let it be to you according to your faith. Persistent, following, pushing, going after it, believing in the midst of it. Do we even know what that kind of prayer is like anymore? This next one. I'm 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 gonna teach just a message just on her. This is so rich. Matthew chapter 15, she's known as the Canaanite woman. woman. Listen to this. I love this. Verse 21, then Jesus went out from there and departed to the region of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a woman of Canaan, that means she was a pagan, by the way, came from that region and cried out to him, saying, have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely demon-possessed. Now, how does a woman who has a severely demon-possessed daughter cry out to the man she thinks could probably help? I'm telling you, she's not quiet. She doesn't lack passion. She's pressing in. So she cries out to him, have mercy on me. My daughter is severely demon-possessed. And he answered her not a word. Jesus ignores her. Well, Jesus wouldn't do that. Jesus ignored her because he's he's getting at something deeper in her. And his disciples came and urged Jesus, saying, send her away, for she cries out after us. Sound familiar? She's wearying us. She doesn't stop crying out. She's making too much noise. She's bothering us. She's troubling us. Send her away. But he answered and said, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. First he ignores her, then he tells her, you're not in the club. I'm I'm here for the Israelites, not you. This is almost getting worse, isn't it? First he ignores her and then tells her, you're not worthy of me healing your severely demon-possessed daughter. Then she came and worshiped him saying, Lord, help me. It doesn't get any more demanding than that. Lord, help me. But he answered and said, it's not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. Ignoring her at this point is is the nicest of everything he said so far. And she said, yes, Lord, yet even the little dogs eat the crumbs which fall from the master's table. Faith-filled persistence. She's not letting go. She's not giving up. 
She is continuing until she gets her miracle. The first no isn't just always a no, it's to see what you know. And what does she display that she knows about him? I know I'm not an Israelite, I'm a pagan Canaanite. But I know there is something about me and my need that qualifies me even as a little dog to just get a scrap that would fall from the master's table. Just a, just a little something. Because I know, Jesus, even a little something from you will heal my severely demon-possessed daughter. Man, I read that and go, Lord, teach me to pray like that pagan Canaanite woman. Teach me to pray like Mary prayed and made her ask and didn't quit and didn't give up. Teach us all that. The fourth and final thing. There's got to be sacrificial obedience. Do you know, beloved, that God allows us to be involved in miracles? We're not the source of it, but, but sometimes we're the, we're the participant in it. We're, we're the person who, I don't know what, we facilitate it. I'll say it that way. We get to participate and facilitate, but we're not the source. Back in our original story, the story tells us that there were six water pots of stone, stone, six water pots of stone there. They were 20 to 30 gallons a piece. And Jesus said to the servants, go fill them with water. Again, we read that and go, yeah, okay, no big deal. This was a water pot made of stone. It was about the size of the trash can that when you were a little kid and you were raking the leaves to throw the leaves in the trash can for your parents, it's about that size. They hold 20 or 30 gallons a piece. One gallon of water weighs 8.345 pounds. So if it was 20 to 30 gallons a piece, that means that those stone pots without or the, excuse me, those stone pots that we don't know how much they weighed, just the water weight was anywhere between 210 and 250 pounds. And they didn't have a high, high power industrial spigot to get the water from. They're schlepping around those big old pots and they're taking them over to the well and they're filling them up bucket after bucket after bucket after bucket. How much time, how much sacrifice, how much inconvenience does that take? And yet it says that they filled it to the brim. There was no shortcut with them. I love this about them. Good hard workers. America, start working hard again. No shortcuts. They fill it to the brim because they're going to participate and they're going to do what Mary said. Anything he tells you to do, do it. So they did it. They participated And the miracle happened. Sacrificial obedience. Inconvenience, if you will. All throughout the scripture when miracles happen. Luke chapter five, the fishermen are done fishing. This is the beginning of Jesus' ministry. They've been fishing all night. They didn't catch a thing. They're back on the shore. They've got their boat. They're washing the nets. They are finished. Jesus comes up and says, launch out into the deep. That stupid, ridiculous talk to a professional fisherman. Lord, we've been fishing all night and hadn't caught anything. Nevertheless, this is a powerful spiritual word. Nevertheless, at your word, we'll do it. They launch out, and what happens? They get a catch. Because they understand sacrificial obedience, ridiculous sometimes obedience causes the miracle to happen. Matthew chapter 14, five loaves and two fish. Matthew chapter 15, seven loaves and two fish feeds thousands of people because although they're giving nowhere near enough to facilitate the thousands of people that are there, they are giving what they have sacrificially and God causes the miracle to happen in their midst. 
Right there, so tangible. He, he, he instructs him and says, go fill up the fragments, the leftovers. Fill them up right here in these baskets. Feel it, touch it, see it. You're a part of a miracle. Undeniable, tangible in your midst. John 21, after the resurrection, Jesus is on the shore in Galilee. I've been there many, many times. He sees his friends out fishing. He knows who they are. He knows they're toiling. They have been fishing all night. They haven't caught a thing. Friends, do you, do you have any food? No! Throw your net on the right side of the boat. You crazy? They didn't say that. They throw the net on the right side of the boat. After being tired and inconvenienced and this seems crazy and why do it? And they got such a catch that they couldn't even get the fish in the boat or to the shore. Friends, listen to me. In order for you to obtain your miracle, there might be a degree of sacrificial obedience that you're gonna have to participate in to see it happen, to see it come to pass. And so the need, don't let it overwhelm you. The ask, make sure that it is heartfelt and passionate. The faith-filled persistence, it speaks for itself. You keep on keeping on. And finally, sacrificial obedience. Whatever it is he might ask you to do, I don't know what he might ask you to do. But it might sound ridiculous. It might inconvenience you. It might be sacrificial. But do whatever he says. That's how the miracle came to pass. All right, so let's just end with this right here, right now. A miracle that you need is a miracle that you need. It doesn't matter whether I think it's a miracle. Something to me could be, you know, could be, I could look at your situation and think it's small or vice versa. But I just want to say your miracle is your miracle. So if you're here this morning and, and you could say, Pastor Steve, I need a miracle. I need God to, to intervene in my situation in such a way that the natural order of things is gonna be upset, turned right side up, and have a miraculous answer to it. If you need a miracle this morning, right where you're at, I'm not gonna ask you to come forward, just stand on your feet right where you're at. If you need a miracle this morning. Good. All right, friends, now look, look around the room and look at the precious, sweet people that need a miracle this morning. These are real people with real needs. Again, to you, some might seem more urgent than others, but these are real needs that are represented. Now, here's what we get to do. Here's the honor and the privilege of what we get to do as the body of Christ. We get to pray for them. So here's what I want you to do next. If there's someone standing by you, you're not gonna have to do anything, but just gently lay your hand on their shoulder. Go ahead, look around the room, find somebody close by. Find somebody close by. I don't want one person who's standing to not have a, sh a hand on their shoulder. The Bible says that we get to bear one another's burdens and fulfill the law of Christ. The scripture, Jesus said, if we would touch and agree, that he would move and answer. Anybody who's standing that still needs someone to come and, and touch them. Ladies, you got someone with you right there? You're, you're with, with that sweet lady? Okay, you guys are good. Just want to make sure. Okay. Now, let's pray. And at least let's ask God to start the miracle working process. So Father, in the name of Jesus, we come to you right now, God, and we recognize these needs. God, our hearts go out to these precious people. Lord, they, they are humble enough and courageous enough to stand in a room probably filled with strangers and say, God, they need you. 
And so, Father, we're asking in the name of Jesus right now, we're asking with desperation, Lord, would you come and move on their situation with a miracle? God, we don't know enough to plead our case or to give our argument to you, but we can ask with desperation for very real needs. Lord, would you move? Lord, we're asking you to move because you're a good God and a merciful God and nothing is impossible for you. And with you, all things are possible. And so, Father, in the matchless name of Jesus, the name that's above every name, the name that's above cancer, the name that's above financial problems, the name that's above marriage problems, the name that's above every other name, God, we ask you in the name of Jesus to meet the needs of these precious sons and daughters of yours, to show yourself strong on their behalf. Lord, like it said in John 2, would you manifest your glory in their lives and would you cause our faith to be increased as a result of what you're doing? Father, in the name of Jesus, we add this prayer, I'm sure, to the prayers that have been prayed. And with faith-filled, persistent, and a heartfelt ask, Lord, move, we pray. Now, God, going forward, if there's anything that you've required of us or asked us to do sacrificially, Lord, even ridiculously, Lord, we pray that we would obey. That we would obey. That even if we have to say, Lord, nevertheless, contrary to logic, experience, and professionalism, nevertheless, at your word, I'm gonna do what you said. Father, in the name of Jesus, we pray that there would be a release of miracles right here, right now, in this house for your glory. Does anybody agree with that this morning? God, would you work miracles over every one of these people's lives? Would you bring peace, oh God, where there's chaos? Would you bring healing, Lord, where there's sickness? God, where there's disaster and calamity, would you bring restoration, peace, life, Lord, you know the need, and we appeal to you being a good, miracle-working God. God, touch, heal, deliver, restore, order. In the name of Jesus, may this miracle working process go that much closer to the miracle being realized in these precious people's lives. May it be started now for the first time. Miracle working God, do your stuff like you have so many times before. We look forward to you manifesting your glory and increasing our faith. Do it, Lord, we pray now, all over the room. Everybody online, Lord, touch people all over the place. In Jesus' name, and God's expectant, miracle-believing people said, amen, amen. 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 Listen, which, amen. Now you give that person we just prayed for, you just give them a little hug, a high five, something. You just give them a sign of affection. Let them know you're praying for them. God bless you guys. We'll see you very, very soon. Have an awesome day today.